The war began here, at the 38th parallel. Just how did this imaginary line become the fuse for a three-year explosion? On June 25th, 1950, communist North Korea crosses the 38th parallel into South Korea. What was once considered a pawn in Asian politics now takes center stage across the globe. Armed with Soviet weaponry, American advisors are pushed to the edge of the Korean peninsula, causing Harry Truman, in a decision that defines his presidency, to take action. Three days later, under authorization by the United Nations, American forces are sent back to Asia, where just five years before, they had battled Japan in a brutal struggle. By Truman's orders, airstrikes against communist forces on both sides of the 38th parallel are approved. And in looking for a plane to complete this mission, one of the greatest bombers in history is brought out of mothballs to fight another day. The B-29 Superfortress, the airplane that brought Japan down to its knees, the airplane that symbolized America's industrial strength, and the airplane that dropped the most infamous bomb in history rises from the ashes. Its goal this time is to destroy the highly industrialized North the same way it decimated the land of the rising sun. To knock out bridges, dams, and railways. To reduce the city centers of Pyongyang, Chongyin, and Rashin into rubble. But unfortunately for the B-29, a fighter bearing the Red Star, incorporating swept wings and jet technology, writes the obituary for this mighty bomber, ending its impressive run as America's greatest aircraft. Following the defeat of both Germany and Japan, the American people celebrate after nearly four years of sacrifice and struggle. With the powers of Europe in economic ruins, the United States emerges as an undisputed superpower. At the same time, the Soviet Union, America's biggest ally during the fight against the Nazis, begins to flex its muscles across the globe. There was already a lot of animosity and tension and uh, a lack of clarity about exactly how the two would stack up. Uh, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that nobody really knew a grand vision for, for Europe, even as, as Nazi Germany collapsed. Following VE Day, communist states are established across Eastern Europe, presenting a direct threat to Western democracies allied with America. At Potsdam, it becomes clear that a new Cold War is taking shape between these two former allies. When I went to Potsdam, I thought I could get along with Stalin. How mistaken I was. He made 32 agreements, and he broke every single one of them. What are you going to do with an outfit like that? I found out as things developed that the objective of the Russians was to dominate the whole of Western Europe. With an iron curtain dividing Europe, President Harry Truman moves quickly to contain Soviet expansion. Billions of dollars in financial aid is provided to Western European countries, still in economic shambles after the war. Known as the Marshall Plan, a line in the sand is drawn between Stalin and America. Why must the United States carry so great a load in helping Europe? The answer is simple. The United States is the only country in the world today which has the economic power and productivity to furnish the needed assistance. From a Soviet perspective, it was a weapon that they just couldn't possibly equal. Uh, money, $13 billion in 1947 when it's uh, promulgated, is just something the Soviets couldn't even possibly counter in their wildest dreams. There's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. Next, in what solidifies the image of Americans as liberators, food and materials are flown into a blockaded West Berlin during the greatest airlift in history. And finally, 
the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is established, with each member in this military alliance pledging to come to the other's aid in case of an enemy attack. Back in Washington, D.C., the Truman Doctrine of Containment calls for a radical change in how the military operates. By executive order, on July 26, 1947, the President signs into law the National Security Act, bringing the Army and Navy under one umbrella known as the Department of Defense. In addition, the dream of Army Air Force Chief Hap Arnold comes true when the United States Army Air Force becomes a separate independent branch of the military. And with its creation, this new department has big plans on how to defeat the communists. With the growing Soviet threat, it becomes vital for America to possess a truly intercontinental bomber. In the factories of Convair, the gigantic B-36 Peacemaker, having a wingspan of 230 feet, six radial engines, four turbojets, and a payload of over 70,000 pounds, is wheeled out for the first time. With this behemoth, the United States can now fly straight into the Soviet Union to deliver a fatal blow. The, B, the B-36 was intended as a, um, the doomsday weapon against the Soviet Union. It would you drop the atomic bombs which would bring the Soviet Union to its knees, and, and it would have done that. And that's, that's why they call it the peacemaker, because it kept the peace because of its capability. As a result, its predecessor, the B-29 Superfortress, once the biggest plane in the world, now becomes a medium-range bomber. Another revolution in aircraft design also happens during this period. Propeller-driven planes are phased out by jet engines, giving pilots the ability to fly significantly faster with this new form of propulsion. The P-51 Mustang, an aircraft that ruled the skies over Germany and Japan, is replaced with Lockheed's F-80 Shooting Star, a jet-powered aircraft with a maximum speed of 600 miles per hour. While this research and development continues, on the continent of Asia, the balance of power shifts dramatically in 1949 when Mao Zedong becomes the first chairman of the newly created People's Republic of China. With this transformation, the United States' biggest ally in the fight against Japan becomes part of the Soviet sphere of influence, making it now one of America's biggest enemies. That same year, Stalin acquires the technology to develop the atomic bomb, destroying the United States' nuclear monopoly. The Soviet Union getting the atomic bomb followed quickly, chronologically, uh, by the fall of China. You know, are, are very, very close in, in the chronological period, and they, they feed, in the United States in particular, this, this conception of communism rolling over, a monolithic communism spreading throughout Europe, and it, it breeds, obviously, the sort of hostility and, and you know, ideological uh, blinders on, if you will, that the McCarthy era comes uh, best known to be associated with, but it, it's, it's certainly a massive shift in American perception. With the tension escalating, it becomes clear that a showdown is on the horizon. The only question is, where? In this Cold War, instead of a direct confrontation between the two superpowers, proxy battles take place in faraway lands. And in 1945, very few could have guessed that a third world war would almost break out over a tiny strip of Asian land south of the Yalu River. The nation of Korea, a protectorate of Japan since 1905, is liberated following the end of the Second World War, with the Soviets occupying the highly industrialized North and the Americans managing the agrarian South, with the 38th parallel being the dividing line. When we think about North Korea during the Korean War, it helps to remember that the Japanese had occupied Korea from 1905 until 1945, and they had created a modern infrastructure of roads, railways, factories, industrial facilities, and had brought North Korea very far along toward becoming a more modern state. And indeed, in 1950, North Korea was probably in many ways in better shape than it is today. 
For five years, tensions escalate between the opposing sides, with war almost inevitable. In southern Korea, in the American zone, native communists, inspired by their brothers to the north, have succeeded in vastly complicating American plans for Korean self-rule. 1949, the American Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, delivered a speech in which he attempted to convey a firm U.S. position toward the Soviet Union and listed uh, allied countries that the United States would defend if there were trouble caused by Soviet aggression, and he left out Korea. Not very many Americans noticed that Korea was left out of the Dean Acheson speech, but the North Koreans noticed it. The hostilities brewing for half a decade finally erupt on June 25, 1950, when North Korean forces armed with Soviet tanks cross the 38th parallel, making American and South Korean forces hold on for dear life at the Pusan perimeter. We're pathetically weak in the Far East. Uh, the uh, North Koreans wanted to reunite the peninsula. They always have, they always will. And they persuaded uh, both the leaders in Russia and in China that they could pull it off in just a few days. So to give them a fait accompli before the United States could react, the peninsula would be reunited. And both Russian and uh, Chinese leaders believed that the United States wouldn't respond. When North Korean forces invaded South Korea on June 25th, 1950, nobody in Washington was expecting that to happen, nor were we prepared for it. When Truman hears that his outnumbered soldiers are on the brink of being pushed into the Sea of Japan, the president moves quickly in getting United Nations approval to send troops to the Korean Peninsula. When the Soviet ambassador walks out of the Security Council weeks before in protest, his absence clears the way for a resolution, authorizing the use of force against this act of aggression. By the 27th of June, Truman orders General Douglas MacArthur, the head of SCAP in Japan, to mobilize U.S. ground forces for battle in what the president describes as a police action in order to avoid congressional approval. Backing them up, airstrikes against North Korean targets that include troop concentrations, supply depots, and rail yards are approved. Looking for a plane to perform this task, the newly created United States Air Force turns to its very best. The Korean War was being fought with the older aircraft in inventory, and that, in the, in the world of bombers, meant the B-29. Boeing's B-29 Superfortress, a four-engine bomber responsible for the destruction of Japanese cities, is selected as the centerpiece in the bombing campaign against North Korea. Known as the Billion Dollar Gamble, having been built in the factories of Georgia, Nebraska, and Kansas, this airplane proves decisive in weakening Hirohito's war machine as thousands of sorties decimate square miles of Japan. With cities firebombed by incendiaries, a controversial strategy approved by General Curtis LeMay, the most famous bombing mission of all time, is carried out on a B-29 when the Enola Gay drops the first atomic weapon in history on the city of Hiroshima, opening up a nuclear Pandora's box where just one bomb can wipe out an entire population. Uh, and I think it's useful to, you know, remember Einstein, right, saying, I don't know how they're going to fight this war, but I guarantee you how they'll fight the next with sticks and stones. Um, you know, he understood in general terms the magnitude of what they were doing, but in terms of the immediate, uh, you know, implications, political, military, or, or even scientific, it was, it was unclear to much of the world. It was just big, uh, and nobody really knew enough about it to, to say exactly how big it was going to be. Post-war, Despite the Superfortress being downgraded to a medium-range bomber, with many of them sold for scrap, the existing B-29s still carry out some of the Air Force's most historic missions. The Pakusan Dreamboat travels non-stop from Honolulu, Hawaii to Cairo, Egypt in a record 39 hours and 36 minutes. On Bikini Atoll, the B-29 drops the atomic bomb in a series of tests during Operation Crossroads. And finally, 
A specially modified superfortress carries on its wings Bell's rocket-powered X-1, where on October 14, 1947, the sound barrier is broken by pilot Chuck Yeager. Now, B-29s stationed at Anderson Air Base in Guam are ordered to land in Okinawa. The B-29 was the only available alternative. Uh, SAC was not going to let its handful of B-50s, which it had acquired by that time, be assigned to this role. The B-36 would be an overkill, uh, and they didn't want to risk that. They were, they were the prime assets for use against the Soviet Union, so uh, they began pulling these poor, tired B-29s out of uh, the depots where they were stored, stripping them down and restoring them. And they also began pull, pulling out the poor, tired reserve officers who had fought one war, were happily sent over the now as dentists or students or cops or whatever, and were extremely upset about being recalled to fight this war. Their mission is to delay the enemy by maintaining air superiority, destroying bridges and railways. However, the B-29's greatest limitation is neither in its payload nor in its outdated equipment. Instead, it comes from Washington, D.C., where orders are given not to attack China or the Soviet Union, the two nations supplying the North Koreans with military equipment. There was a great fear that if you went too far, uh, you would provoke uh, Russian uh, intervention, perhaps, and you might invoke formal Chinese intervention. Now, the Chinese reaction, the Chinese did not declare war on us. They simply sent hundreds of thousands of troops and equipment south. So there was a uh, desire to avoid the sudden extension of the war, and they felt that bombing across the Yalu might precipitate that. So no matter how many sorties are flown north of the 38th parallel, in the end, the strategic bombing campaign is going to have finite limits in terms of an effective payoff. It is a controversial decision by the Truman administration that is hotly debated by American military leaders. When United States aircraft enters Korea, it becomes evident that after a period of post-war demobilization, they are not prepared for this conflict. Uh, the, the bulk of the forces that we had over there were a few B-26 outfits that could go over and do some interdiction. And uh, B-51s uh, came in later. We had some uh, jets that uh, had a tough time getting over there and getting back to Japan. It was a very, very meager effort, but oddly enough, it was just sufficient to stall them to the point that uh, the Pusan perimeter held and we had a chance to build up a little bit. The F-80, designed as a high-altitude interceptor, performs so poorly in ground attacks that Second World War Mustangs are pulled out of storage to close the gap. And with vital targets in China off-limits for the B-29 and its counterpart, the B-26 invader, the words of General Omar Bradley ring true that Korea is the wrong war, at the wrong place, against the wrong enemy. Despite these constraints, the 100-plus superfortresses America has are put to work immediately. To stop the flow of supplies traveling south, B-29s are sent from Okinawa to bomb the highly industrialized north. Chongyin, Hungnam, Rashin and the capital Pyongyang are to be attacked mercilessly. A typical sortie carrying 40 500 pound bombs wreaks havoc, and by September of 1950, North Korea is destroyed. Unable to employ fighters and having such weak anti aircraft defense, the B 29 is able to complete its mission flawlessly. The uh, B 29s did do useful work in destroying. Uh, what little industry the North Koreans had, and uh, they were invaluable in the interdiction role, and that's a role for which they had never been designed, but uh, they, they, they were successful in it. By the end of October, over 30,000 tons of bombs are dropped, exceeding World War II records. While this air war ensues, on the ground, MacArthur pulls off one of the most spectacular amphibious assaults in history, during the battle at Incheon, where 40,000 troops land successfully on the beaches. Uh, you talk about uh, laying it all on the line. MacArthur had his whole career laid on the line there. He could easily have failed by reasons of a storm or some other miscalculations, but the Incheon invasion succeeded. And when they got there, what they found was that 
uh, the uh, North Koreans have become a paper tiger because of the interdiction. There are so many tanks and trucks destroyed on the road that the invading, and we were now the invading armies, we were going up into North Korea. We're amazed to find how much destruction had been wrought by air power and, and by such a limited amount of air power. Two months later, UN troops not only take back all of South Korea, but are told to cross the 38th parallel to unite the two countries. Because of this decision, the Joint Chiefs of Staff orders a halt to the bombing of strategic targets in the north. By October of 1950, with UN forces now at the Yalu River, it appears the war is all but won by MacArthur's men. And I went home feeling very, very good about the situation. When I got to San Francisco, I made a speech on the subject and complimented him on what he had done and told the American people and that I didn't think the Chinese were coming into Korea. And then, you know what happened. Days later, Mao's China comes to North Korea's rescue, launching a fierce counterstrike of 180,000 men, pushing coalition troops south of the 38th parallel. Chinese forces entered the war in November 1950, and and reversed the tide of the war and defeated the U.S. Uh, soldiers and Marines who were in North Korea at the time and began a massive offensive and for a period of time appeared to be winning the war. Ironically, these forces enter the war zone through a series of bridges that were off limits for the B-29. With the Chinese firmly entrenched on the battlefield, a bitter war of attrition ensues for more than two years. With the situation being drastically altered, superfortresses are permitted to step up their campaign. On November 7th, 70 B-29s drop nearly 600 tons on the city of Sinuiju. Two raids against Pyongyang in January of 1951 destroy 35% of the city. The B-29s had a capacity that uh, the other uh, elements of the Air Force lacked, and that was to a major target came up as what happened when the, later in the war the North Koreans established airfields uh, to operate from uh, in, in the South Korean area where that they had occupied. B-29s could simply just take them out. They, they would go over and obliterate them. Now, there were some losses incurred in this, but they were still an effective weapon for that kind of work. However, the aircraft's limitations are becoming evident during the Korean campaign. With improved anti-aircraft artillery forcing these planes to fly at altitudes above 18,000 feet, trying to hit a bridge or any other pinpoint target becomes a daunting task. Contributing to this sense of frustration, 500,000 North Koreans work at night to repair damaged rail lines and bridges, fixing them in as fast as two hours. And in what seals this bomber's fate, the B-29 meets its most fierce opponent in the Soviet MiG-15, a jet-powered fighter aircraft built in mass, incorporating a swept-wing design to ensure greater speed, appears for the first time in combat. In order to mask Stalin's involvement, these planes are bartered to the Chinese, whose pilots begin flying them over Korea. Using jet engine technology that oddly enough is given to them by the British, this aircraft proves superior over the battlefield, flying almost 200 miles faster than the F-80. Ironically, China, one of the poorest countries in the world, now possesses an airplane more advanced than anything America owns. Unlike the Second World War, where no Japanese fighter could reach the B-29's top altitude, the MiG-15's ceiling is at over 50,000 feet. This allows it to hover over the superfortress, waiting for the perfect opportunity to come swooping down. And with a maximum speed of just under 700 miles per hour, this Soviet concoction proves to be the perfect antidote to the B-29 menace. Even with F-80 and F-84 escort, they are no match for the MiG's 37 and 20 millimeter cannons, with just a few hits being enough to bring down America's once mighty bomber. The role of the B-29 changed significantly with the introduction of the MiG-15. 
Uh, we didn't have fighters there that could defend it as, as escort fighters because the Republic F-84 and like EP-80 simply weren't up to the MiG-15. There were targets instead of uh, uh, counters. And the B-29 itself, uh, its firing mechanisms couldn't track the MiG-15s, they were so fast. So uh, the role was changed from day bomber to night bomber. Encountering flak from MiG-15s, numerous superfortresses are easily shot down over Korea. As a result, future bombing missions are to be conducted only at night. And for the remainder of the war, the B-29's undersurface are painted black. Many of the B-29s that you see in pictures from the Korean War have their undersides painted black. That is to make them more difficult to see by the enemy using searchlights. Even more frustrating for pilots is the policy prohibiting attacks against Chinese targets north of the Yalu, where communist planes and equipment being shipped by the trainload from Russia can fly across the border with immunity. An American pilot could be flying along the Yalu and could look down and could see row after row of MiGs basking in the sun, but we were throughout that entire time, and indeed throughout the entire Korean War, bound by a rule that was made in Washington that we would not cross the border between North Korea into China. It is a controversial decision by Truman as the war enters its second year. General MacArthur and I came to grips over this thing. We fell out on that very thing. He wanted to chase these planes over the border here and bomb the Chinese uh, back behind the Korean border, as well as to move an, our army up and really fight a war here with communist China. That we couldn't stand for because Russia and China had a mutual defense pact. If we had crossed the Yale River into communist China, our bomb Manchuria, the Russians would have come to the aid of the Chinese, and that would have immediately brought on a third world war. The MiG-15 proves to be so dominating that the straight-winged F-80 shooting stars, F-84 Thunder Jets, and F-9F Panthers are easily outmaneuvered. This causes the U.S. government to call up North American Aviation's F-86 Sabre, the only fighter that stands a chance against the MiG. Despite its limitations, the Sabre proves itself during some of the greatest dogfights in aviation history. With these two planes going head to head, the Superfortress continues bombing dams, airfields and bridges, hoping to cripple what is left of North Korea's infrastructure. Despite this destruction, on the ground, a virtual stalemate continues. General MacArthur had a very aggressive uh, desire and plan not only to use nuclear weapons to prevent further Chinese intervention in Korea, but also to turn loose the nationalist Chinese on the island of Formosa, known today as Taiwan, to invade China and create a second front. And it was not the wish of our leaders in Washington to expand the Korean War because they believed that that would lead to a world nuclear war with the Soviet Union. With Truman firing General MacArthur, the president sinks to all-time lows in popularity as the Korean War becomes a quagmire with no end in sight. By 1953, as Dwight Eisenhower enters the White House, a ceasefire that remains in effect to this day is signed between the two sides, ending the war after more than three years of fighting. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. And it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. It is, however, only a step toward what must yet be done. The task now is to put the ceasefire agreement into full effect as quickly as we can and get down to working out an enduring settlement of the Korean problem. Assessing the B-29's impact on the battlefield, the balance sheets provide mixed results. 
On the plus side, for an aircraft designed in 1940, who many thought would never be used again, it flies all but 21 days in a campaign lasting 37 months. With 21,000 sorties dropping 167,000 tons of bombs, the superfortress was able to wreak havoc on North Korea. However, with the armistice in effect, it becomes clear that the B-29's days as a frontline bomber are over. With 16 being shot down by MiG-15s, and close to three times that amount being written off in crash landings, this Second World War era aircraft's greatest days are finished. And with jet technology here to stay, the plane is used for only experimental flights, being phased out after a service career spanning three decades. Even its propeller-driven successor, the B-36 is put into retirement with the introduction of missile technology, making it relatively easy for the other side to shoot down a costly aircraft. Nonetheless, the legacy of the Superfortress would live on. A new line of jet bombers that would rule over the skies for the second half of the century, the B-47 Stratajet and the B-52 Stratofortress proudly carry on the B-29's reputation as an aircraft that dominated over the battlefield. Air power ended the Pacific War in a way beyond the imagination of any of the visionary pre-war strategists. None of the Japanese or American planning have been conducted with any idea of the two weapons which would bring the war so completely and so suddenly to an end. The Boeing Superfortress and the Atomic Bomb. Conventional air power had gone a long way toward defeating the Japanese but they were determined to resist an invasion with every weapon at their disposal. The Japanese were a homogeneous nation, 100 million strong. They were willing to die for their country and for their emperor. The Boeing B-29 was the most expensive single project of World War II. It costs more than $3 billion for design, development, production, and deployment. The Manhattan Project, which resulted in the atomic bomb, cost $2 billion. The B-29 was clearly the most outstanding bomber in the war by any standards of performance. It was far ahead of the American B-17 and the British Lancaster. The Superfortress was the joint project of a few visionary American Corps planners. They were aided by General Hap Arnold, who pushed the program through the spite of many hazards. The other important factor was the engineering strength and heavy bomber experience of the Boeing Aircraft Corporation. By 1940, it seemed possible that England would be invaded and occupied. That meant that Nazi Germany would have to be bombed by US bases. The Air Corps called for a speed of 400 miles an hour, a range of 5,333 miles and a 2,000 pound bomb load. It was an audacious gamble of the part of the Air Corps and of the Boeing company. Boeing was perhaps taking the greater chance. The Air Corps could hedge its bets with other manufacturers for less ambitious airplanes. But Boeing had to rely not only on its own capability, it also had to trust its vendors. Many of them were being asked to create components fully as advanced as the aircraft itself. Shortcuts had to be taken. Each one added to an already ambitious program. Dollars were freely available, but they were not always a solution.
The handsome, streamlined airframe was a radical departure from all previous Boeing practice, and involved new metals and new fabrication techniques. Boeing's entire production capacity was occupied with building the B-17. For the B-29, it was necessary to build entire new plants, and there was a greater challenge. The creation of a new, highly skilled workforce. Vast schools were established on the factory sites, with 90 days of training or less. Farmers, housewives, and young people just out of high school were taught how to do everything necessary to build the most complex aircraft in history. By 1943, Boeing had 58,000 employees building the B-29. Boeing knew from the start that its greatest question mark was the unproven engine. The R-3350 needed several years more development than was available. It would go into the field unready. It would be a constant nightmare to mechanics and a worry to pilots taking off with two heavy loads from two short runways. Even with the R-3350's power, the speed and range requirements were too difficult to attain. They could only be achieved by combining a highly streamlined design with a wing using a new Boeing high-lift airfoil and sophisticated flap system. The USAAF thought Boeing's approach was too radical. They thought the wing loading was too high and that its pilots wouldn't be able to handle the airplane. They cited the experience of the notorious Martin B-26 as an example. Boeing analyzed the B-26 and found that it had a low aspect ratio wing mounted on the fuselage in a way that induced drag. They explained that the B-26 problem stemmed out from bad design. They said that the B-29's excellent design would avoid difficulties. To achieve the necessary performance, the B-29 had to operate at high altitudes. For this, pressurization of the fuselage was mandatory. Boeing had experimented with pressurization in the Model 307 Stratoliner passenger plane, but no production bomber had ever been pressurized. The B-29 adopted a new three-bubble system. The pilot, co-pilot, engineer, radio operator, and navigator were up in the front pod. The gunners were positioned in the mid-fuselage pressurized area and connected to the cockpit by a tunnel spanning the twin bomb bays. The tail gunner was crammed into a third pressurized compartment in the rear, isolated and very much alone. Because of the pressurization system, standard gun turrets could not be used. The armament had to be remotely operated. A general electric fire control system had to be created. It used an early computer that compensated for speed, range, altitude, wind temperature, and trajectory. The results were remarkably good. Any gunner apart from the tail gunner could control more than one station. The computers permitted firing at targets beyond the range of conventional hand-operated guns. The demand for the Boeing B-29 increased. Rival firms Bell Aircraft and Glen O'Martin were tasked to build it. Boeing felt it was being asked to train competition for the post-war marketplace. By the time the XB-29 made its first flight on September 21, 1942, the USAAF had placed a mammoth order for 1,664 of the aircraft. But the first two prototypes caught fire in the air. The second one crashed into a meat packing plant. The entire crew was killed. In spite of all the difficulties, the first B-29 of the 58th Bombardment Wing landed at Karagpur, India on April 24, 1944 to begin Operation Matterhorn. Operation Matterhorn was designed to knock out the Japanese steel industry. The idea of B-29 bombing Japan from Chinese bases was attractive in political terms. 
President Roosevelt had promised Shanghai Shek to begin bombing operations against Japan by November 1944. But in practice, it was flawed for a wide variety of economic, logistic, and command reasons. Shanghai Shek's subordinates refused to get serious about building air bases until enough money had been paid to permit embezzlement on a massive scale. Army General Vinegar Joe Stilwell estimated that at least half of the 100 million in gold required by the Chinese was siphoned off to corrupt officials. The airbases themselves were a monument to the patience and industry of the Chinese people. They literally built them by hand, without power equipment of any sort. They used the most primitive tools to move earth or chip stones. The operation was based on the assumption that the B-29s would support their own operations by flying gasoline over the hump, the high mountain passes in the Himalayas separating India and China. The B-29s would be supported by a fleet of B-24s serving as tankers. But the B-29 was a brand new weapon that had not yet received sufficient testing. It would be bad practice to subject it to continuous flights over the mountains. Then, there was the primitive maintenance and the continuing shortage of parts and labor. But the task had to be done. There was no alternative. The complexity of the logistics was a function of the sheer size of the B-29 units. The Superfortress had a crew of seven. Seven aircraft were assigned per squadron, and there were 28 per group, and a grand total of 112 for the wing. Each B-29 was assigned two crews. A fully manned wing had a total personnel of 11,112. When all its elements arrived overseas, 20th Bomber Command had more than 20,000 officers and men plucked down in brand new bases in India and China, eager to go to war. Lieutenant General George Stratemeyer was made responsible for the 20th Bomber Command's administration and logistics. General Claire Chenault was responsible for the fighter defense and complete ground support of the B-29 bases in China. The B-29's very first combat raid was mounted on June 5, 1944. General Wolfe led 98 aircraft against the railroad marshalling yards in Bangkok, Thailand. Five aircraft crashed en route, 42 had to make emergency landings. Later reconnaissance revealed that fewer than 20 bombs had landed in the target area. It was not a good start for the $3 billion program. The commanders were veterans on the European theater. They were not yet aware of how different the B-29 was from the B-17. Nor were they aware of how difficult the Japanese targets, geography, and weather were compared to Germany's. Hap Arnold demanded better results. He wanted an attack on the Japanese homeland. On June 15th, Wolf launched 92 B-29s from India. Of these, only 79 reached their Chinese staging bases. 78 were dispatched on a night raid against the steel mills of Yawata and Kyushu, Japan. Each plane carried two tons of bombs. The results were once again disappointing. Only 47 aircraft made it to Yawata. Only one bomb hit Yawata. It damaged a power station more than half a mile from the steel mill coke ovens. The Americans took comfort in the damage they must have caused to Japanese morale, but Arnold was not after Japanese morale. He was after their industry. The story of the next six months was much the same. 
And at home in the US, there was a myriad of B-29 production problems. Wolf was sent back to sort them out. In September, the 20th Bomber Command was taken over by a firebrand from Europe. His name was Curtis LeMay. The dramatic acceleration of the Pacific War permitted a two-pronged strategy of attack. From bases in Changsu, China, the 1,600-mile operating radius of the B-29 permitted it to hit targets from Manchuria through Japan all the way down to the tip of French Indochina. Superfortresses operating from Saipan and the Marianas could cover all the important targets in the heartland of Japan. Curtis LeMay's 20th Bomber Command was the first of two proms. To provide the second, the 21st Bomber Command was established in November 1944. It was to operate out of new airfields in the Marianas Islands. One of the United States Army Air Force's great planners, Possum Hansel, was made commanding officer of the 21st. Hansel landed his B-29 Jolt and Josie, the Pacific Pioneer, on Saipan on October 12, 1944. He was eager to validate in battle the many plans he participated in creating. Well, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talk. Hansel felt the weight of his responsibility. He knew that even Curtis LeMay, in spite of his success in Europe, was having trouble turning things around against the Japanese and China. LeMay's problems with the 20th Command included difficulty of supply and the unreliability of the B-29's R-3350 engines. Occasionally, good bombing results were obtained. In April 1945, the assets of the 20th Bomber Command would be transferred to Tinian and Guam. By then, it had failed in its essential task of sustained bombing of Japan. So much had been expected of the B-29 that the American commanders were driven to prove that it was in fact an excellent weapon. At the very highest levels of command, where people were aware of the Manhattan Project, the urgency was even greater. Only the B-29 could carry the atomic bomb. If the Superfortress failed, the Manhattan Project became a complete waste. The pressure was felt and transmitted. But in the months after his arrival on Saipan with the 21st, Hansel was able to do no better than had previously been done in the 20th from China. The Committee of Operational Analysis had reconsidered the priorities in Japan. They now suggested that the aviation industry was the most important target. This had been the Air Force's choice all along. The Joint Chiefs of Staff directed that the principal aircraft engine manufacturers around Tokyo became the primary targets. The long series of attacks on Tokyo would be helped by the incredible bravery and skill of the crew of an F-13. The F-13 was the unarmed reconnaissance version of the Superfortress. Early in the morning of November 1st, 1944, Captain Ralph D. Stakely's F-13 became the first U.S. plane to fly over Tokyo since the Doolittle Raid. These photos became the basis for all U.S. attacks on the city. Hansel's first strike on Tokyo was to be called San Antonio 1. After much training and many postponements, San Antonio 1 began at 6.15 a.m. on November 24th. The first plane to roll down Isley Field's runway was Dauntless Dotty, flown by Brigadier General Rosie O'Donnell. His co-pilot, Major Robert K. Morgan, had been a pilot on the famous B-17 Memphis Bell. Dauntless Dottie was followed by 110 more B-29s, carrying 278 tons of bombs. But the promising start to the mission unraveled. 17 aircraft aborted.
Six more found themselves unable to bomb for mechanical reasons. The rest were caught up in a 120 knot wind. It was the infamous jet stream then only just being recognized. They were swept over the target at a blistering 445 miles an hour. It was too fast for accurate bombing. But on the positive side, Japanese fighters' resistance was light, flak was ineffective. Once again, reconnaissance photos showed the bombing results to be totally inadequate. Only 16 bombs had been observed to hit the target area. By now, the B-29 was performing fairly well. Extensive modifications had improved the reliability of its engines. But bombs were still not hitting the targets. The early Japanese analysis was that the costs of the B-29 were so great and its results so negligible that not even a wealthy nation like the United States could afford to persist the attacks. But unknown to all of the Japanese and most of the Americans, a change was in the wind. On December 18th, 1944, 84 B-29s of Curtis LeMay's 20th Bomber Command dropped 500 incendiary bombs in a daylight raid on Hankou, China. The attack destroyed the city as a major Japanese base. As a result of the success of LeMay's incendiary raid, Hansel's 21st Bomber Command was ordered to take a test raid on the city of Nagoya in Japan. It would be made by at least 100 B-29s, all dropping incendiary bombs. Hansel objected, saying that he wanted to continue precision bombing of the Japanese aircraft industry. In doing so, he put his career on the skids. You can buck the brass in the military, but only if you succeed. A test raid was run on Nagoya on January 3, 1945. 97 B-29s carried mostly incendiary bombs. It was not a good mission. Only 57 aircraft bombed the designated target. Damage on the ground was slight. The Japanese drew the conclusion that their fire prevention system was highly efficient. It was an erroneous and eventually disastrous assumption. Hansel reverted to his previous precision bombing tactics. He was unable to generate better results, apart from the one successful attack on the Kawasaki aircraft plant near Kobe. The one success didn't help Hansel. If you work for Hab Arnold, you delivered or you were relieved. Hansel was relieved by Major General Curtis LeMay. Hansel's forte was planning. The time for planning was past. Now was the time for direct action, which was Curtis LeMay's strength. As a new commander, LeMay received more latitude than Hansel. He made two attacks using Hansel's method. Then he put 69 aircraft over Kobe to drop incendiary bombs. There was heavy fighter opposition. Two B-29s were lost and 35 badly damaged. But the city of Kobe was hurt. More than 1,000 buildings were destroyed. In the latter part of the war, America's overwhelming advantage in numbers and quality usually allowed American forces to brush Japanese opposition aside. As the precision bombing efforts continued, further tests were made with incendiary bombs. In a heavy attack on Tokyo on February 25th, almost 30,000 buildings were destroyed but the precision strikes against Japan continued to be ineffective. Enemy fighter opposition stiffened. In this series of attacks in February, 29 B-29s were lost to fighters, 10 were lost to flak.
almost as many were lost on the long overwater trip between Saipan and Japan. Another 21 crashed because of operational problems like engine fires, runaway propellers, or fuel exhaustion. And so far, the results were insignificant. The B-29, the multi-billion dollar bomber, had failed in its intended role. But Curtis LeMay already had the remedy in mind. LeMay was aware that he was as vulnerable to have Arnold's impatience as any other man. He decided to try tactics he'd long considered and which had been carefully tested in the United States. It was the common opinion that Japanese cities were much more vulnerable to firebombing than those of Germany. And although Japanese industry was spread out into residential areas, it was still far more concentrated than its German counterpart. The B-29 had been designed from the start as a high-altitude bomber. In the European theater, it would have had to remain so. But conditions were different in Japan. Anti-aircraft guns and searchlights were not radar-controlled. It was reported that there were only two night fighter units in the homeland. Japanese airborne radar was primitive and not widely used. Without notifying General Arnold, LeMay decided to launch a series of maximum effort, low-level incendiary night attacks against Japan. He was putting his career on the line. Night bombing offered many advantages. The winds were not so strong. The B-29's navigation system operated more efficiently, flying at lower altitude, easing the strain on the engines, lowering the fuel consumption, and leaving behind armament and ammunition permitted as a much bigger bomb load. About 12,000 pounds per plane. The concept of unarmed low-level night bombing alarmed many of LeMay's staff. The word murder was quietly mentioned, but never to LeMay. The first raid was set for the night of March 9th, 334 B-29s carried almost 2,000 tons of bombs. The aircraft and the lead squadrons were to act as simple pathfinders. Their napalm bombs were intended to start major appliance fires, which would require the mobilization of all the Japanese firefighting equipment. The rest of the B-29s each carried 24 cluster units of M-69 incendiary bombs. The M69 was designed by a high-level group of American scientists and engineers, some of whom were also involved in the Manhattan Project. Each M69 was only 20 inches long and 3 inches in diameter. It weighed just over 6 pounds. On crashing through the roof of its target, it was designed to detonate and spew out flaming gel as far as 30 yards. The gel stuck to whatever it hit and it burned with hellish intensity. The technology of the M69 and the great logistics and support effort needed to deliver its target was an expression of the disparity between the American and Japanese war machines in 1945. The Japanese simply had no counter and no equivalent. On the evening of March 9th, it took almost three hours for LeMay's entire forces of B-29s to get airborne. The bombers would approach Tokyo individually, at altitudes from 4,900 to 9,200 feet. Over Tokyo, the visibility was 10 miles or better. The napalm bombs of the Pathfinder aircraft started fires that were fanned by a brisk and rising wind. The initial attack at a 12-mile square of the most densely populated part of the city. The fire spread rapidly and the results were devastating. The fire services were overwhelmed within 30 minutes of the attack. 
a firestorm swept the city. More than one-fourth of a million buildings were destroyed. More than one-fourth of the city's houses were gone. More than a million people were homeless. 83,000 dead. 160,000 injured. The Japanese were horror-stricken. There was no way to comprehend the disaster of this magnitude. It completely overrode the ideas of national superiority and the samurai spirit, and of the nation's place in the sun. On March 11th, the city of Nagoya became a target for incendiary attack. There was no firestorm, but two square miles of the city were destroyed. Osaka was attacked on March 13th. The city was blanketed by cloud cover and the B-29s were forced to use radar bombing. Unexpectedly, that gave more uniform results than visual bombing. Within three hours, more than eight square miles of the city were totally destroyed. Morale and the B-29 units kept climbing. LeMay had found the magic formula. He made maximum use of the B-29 in tactics that took advantage of the enemy's weakness. These tactics converted the B-29 from a blunder to a war winner. LeMay was on a rampage. He drove his crews hard. They were already flying 60 hours a month. That was higher than the average of the 8th Air Force in Europe. But there was a shortage of replacements, and that shortage forced LeMay to increase monthly combat time to 80 hours. He had the scent of victory in his nostrils, victory over Japan, and victory over the concept of air power. LeMay knew that he had arrived at a point that General Coral Spots and Bomber Harris had only dreamed of. He had the ultimate weapon at his disposal, and he knew that there was more to come. He believed that the maximum effort, with his command, could destroy Japan's ability to wage war. The strength of the 21st Bomber Command grew every day. By April, LeMay had more than 500 aircraft at his disposal. On May 11th, he launched a further attack on the three Japanese cities. His goal was to create such havoc that the terrible cost America had borne invading Okinawa would not be repeated in Japan. By June 15th, he had destroyed 112 square miles of Tokyo, Nagoya, Kobe, Osaka, Yokohama, and Kawasaki. His B-29s had now the benefit of long-range escort fighters, P-51s from Iwo Jima. LeMay had destroyed the six principal industry cities of Japan at a cost of 136 aircraft. The American loss rate, 1.9%, was acceptable, but the reality of it was still horrific. Japan was not able to stop this destruction. It lacked anti-aircraft guns, radar, and fighters to repel the invaders. It lacked fire engines, bomb shelters, and hospitals to help its citizens. Yet Japan was held captive by a martial spirit. That spirit had served the country ill on almost every battlefield in this war but the government voted to fight on. LeMay and the 21st Bomber Command had brought Japan to its knees, but it would not surrender. The b 29s success in area bombing was a great relief to all those who had staked so much on its development. At the time, Few people were aware of the Manhattan Project, and the essential role of the B-29 would have been in the successful delivery of an atomic weapon. By July 1941, a decision had been made to create an atomic bomb before the Germans did. The Manhattan Project eventually employed 120,000 people, including the country's top engineers and scientists. On July 16, 1945, an experimental bomb was detonated with results that were incredible even to those who had created it.
Word of the successful test was immediately sent to the new president, Harry S. Truman. Truman, who was a novice, was plunged into the Potsdam Conference with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Truman mentioned to Stalin that a powerful new weapon had been tested. Stalin responded that he hoped it would be tested to good effect against the Japanese. Truman was pleased that Stalin did not press for more information. He was unaware that Stalin already knew what he needed to know from the Soviet spies at the center of the Manhattan Project. The Potsdam Declaration of July 26 indirectly warned the Japanese of the power of a new weapon. It stated that the only alternative to surrender was prompt and utter destruction. Japan was badly wounded by the B-29 raids. It was also cut off from food and industrial imports. Japanese leaders were fully aware that the war was lost, but as yet had not found a way to acknowledge it. A cultural phenomenon emerged unfamiliar to the West. It was Moksazu, a time-honored technique by which a Japanese officer would take refuge in a lofty silence when he did not agree with or did not understand an order. When the new Japanese Prime Minister Suzuki announced his response to the Potsdam Declaration, he used the term Mokatsu. He meant to say, in essence, no comment. But his remarks were translated as meaning that Japan was contemptuously ignoring the declaration. It was a fatal error. In early 1944, plans for modifying 15 B-29s were formulated. The modifications were not extensive, the atomic bombs were being designed at the same time. The designs were adapted as much as possible to fit the B-29's bomb bay. The following summer, Arnold authorized the top-secret team of experts to create the first combat unit to use the new weapon. Colonel Paul W. Tibbetts Jr. was elected as commander of the new 509th Composite Group. The remainder of the group was hand-picked to get the best possible people. For a long time, Tibbetts was the only person in the 509th to know the true nature of the mission. The special facilities required for handling and loading the bomb were prepared in Tinian in the spring of 1945. By July, the 509th and its specially modified B-29s were in place. Further training began immediately with six specialized missions. Some of them involved harassment bombing of isolated garrisons on the islands of Truk and Marcus. After July 20th, the 509th crews executed 38 sorties, gaining experience in the precise tactics to be used when the atomic bomb was dropped. These sorties also made the sight of small formations of B-29 seem customary to the Japanese. A list of target cities was drawn up. They were the largest cities with the least damage remaining in Japan. Kyoto was removed because of its cultural significance and because of the negative reaction in Europe to the bombing of Dresden. Truman and Secretary Stimson felt the destruction of Kyoto might drive Japan into the Russian camp after the war. Hiroshima was now at the head of the line. Later, Nagasaki was added to the list. On Tinian, all necessary elements of the strike were prepared. Field Order Number 13 was signed on August 2, 1945 by Lieutenant General Nathan Twining. It directed the 509th Group to make a visual attack on Hiroshima. At one time, Hiroshima had been a busy naval port, but the port had been mined and the population was now reduced to under a quarter of a million people. There were many military installations. The entire economy was geared to the Japanese war effort. There were no Allied prisoner of war camps in the area. Seven aircraft were assigned to the mission. Leading the principal force was Tibbets and Enola Gay, named after his mother. Enola Gay was accompanied by two escort planes, crammed with cameras and observers to record the event. 
Three aircraft were assigned duty as weather planes, one was designated a spare. On August 4th, the crews were told that the exact nature of the mission and one of the bombs predicted 20,000 tons of TNT power, but even then they were not told it was an atomic bomb. At 2.45 in the morning of August 6, the Enola Gay took off. Five and a half hours later, Tibbets received word that the weather and visibility were good. At exactly 9.15, Enola Gay was flying at 328 miles an hour at 31,600 feet. Bombardier Major Thomas Farabee dropped the bomb. Tibbets then executed what later became known as the breakaway maneuver, a steeply banked 150 degree turn to avoid the expected blast by the time the bomb exploded 50 seconds later. The Enola Gay was 19 miles away. At detonation, there occurred the fireball, followed by the swiftly rising mass of smoke that turned into the notorious mushroom cloud the cloud that still casts its symbolic shadow. President Truman immediately announced the event to the world. The news amazed every many members of the 509th Composite Group. The Japanese reaction was confused. Officially, they diminished the results of the attack. They said that it was only a new bomb which should not be made light of. Certainly not. 4.7 square miles of Hiroshima Center had been obliterated. More than 40,000 buildings were destroyed. Almost 80,000 people were killed. 171,000 were made homeless. LeMay's B-29s and the U.S. Navy's carrier forces maintained pressure against Japan while the sole remaining atomic weapon in the world was prepared for use. The second and last atomic mission of the war began at 3.49 on August 9th. Major Sweeney and his crew flew Boxcar. They traded their aircraft, the Great RTs, to Captain Frederick C. Bach. Sweeney's mission was as troublesome as Tibbet's mission had been trouble-free. The primary target was Kokura, but it was weathered in. Sweeney made three bomb runs. The bombardier couldn't see the target visually. Some Japanese fighters were in the area. Sweeney diverted to the secondary target, Nagasaki, which was also cloud-covered. Boxcar used radio for its run and at the last minute, the bombardier Captain Kermit Behan saw the target at 10.58, he hit the bomb release. Most people were either at work or at home when the bomb detonated within one mile of the two huge Mitsubishi arms factories. Nagasaki's bowl-shaped terrain confined the effects of the bomb to a relatively small 1.45 square mile area. Approximately 35,000 people were killed. Incredibly, Emperor Hirohito's advisors on the Supreme Council for the direction of the war still debated whether or not to surrender. As Adolf Hitler had done, the military factions still wanted to resist in hope of obtaining better terms. On August 19th, the Japanese announced not their surrender, but their willingness to accept the Potsdam Declaration. 
In the days preceding the Japanese statement, routine B-29 missions had continued. On August 11th, they were suspended to give the negotiations a chance to mature. The United States responded to the August 10th Japanese statement by advising that from the moment of surrender, the authority of the Emperor and the Japanese government were subject to the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers. When no word came back from the Japanese government, LeMay's B-29s were authorized to resume attacks. General Arnold had long waited his own Tokyo Millennium, 1,000 aircraft over Tokyo, while General Spatz would have preferred to use such third atomic bomb if one had been available. LeMay was able to meet Arnold's wish. He put up a total of 828 bombers and 186 fighters over 1,000 aircraft in, all over Tokyo on August 14th. Before the last aircraft had landed, Japan had surrendered. The American forces continued to make a display of their air power over Japan. This reached the highlights September 2nd, 462 B-29s cruised over Tokyo Bay. All the surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri. In the meantime, 900 B-29s had dropped almost 5,000 tons of supplies to more than 63,000 prisoners of war. Not only that, but camps in Japan, China, and Korea. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.